Hi, and welcome to Hellbent for Horror, a podcast devoted to all things related to horror. I'm S.A. Bradley, and I'm a lifelong movie lover, but my heart belongs to horror. My biggest thrill, however, is getting to talk to people about this stuff. I really want to start conversations with you. Now, this episode is a companion piece to episode four, Blood Oaths and Bar Tabs, Horror Conventions, and Cinema Wasteland. That episode was about the experiences and connections we make at horror conventions, and some of the people I met were gracious enough to sit for an interview with me. In this episode, we interview Dave Kasanke, the creator of the long-running and legendary underground fanzine Liquid Cheese. It is an exhaustive love letter to everything from hard, heavy metal, to triple X films. Since 1993, Dave has been a one-man army. Liquid Cheese is a true fanzine in every sense of the word. Dave puts the whole thing together himself, and he has done that for 23 years. He's outlived most other fanzines and even one or two professional magazines. The words labor of love were made for Dave Kasanke and Liquid Cheese. Now, an interview from the Abyss with Dave Kasanke. Hi, and uh, welcome back to uh, Hellbent for Horror. This is S.A. Bradley, and I'm at Cinema Wasteland. Uh, that's a series of interviews that I'm doing from Cinema Wasteland. Today we're going to talk with Dave Kasanke. He is the creator of Liquid Cheese, uh, which is a fanzine for horror and, uh, and quite a few other things uh, that are involved, let alone movies. Uh, there are a lot of great stories and uh, music reviews. Uh, Dave, thanks so much for Thank being you. here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, of course, uh, as I I've been telling everybody, uh, I'm uh, the newbie here uh, at Cinema Wasteland, and I was told to come here uh, basically by people that I really thought were very studious about film. And it seems like you have quite a bit of passion around mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. How long have you been coming to uh, Cinema Wasteland? Uh, I started in 2005, and it was actually from John Kitley, who I ended up writing with that first time. The guy who runs Cinema Wasteland, Ken Kish, I've known him because he's a dealer that goes back to the mid 90s and when he started having his own convention he would say because he knew me from interacting at various conventions he'd say Dave I see you at every convention except mine you need to come out and I always kept putting it off for, for various reasons and then finally in 2005 I made the trip and then you know as they say I've never looked back yeah so What's the one thing that you would say really is the, the when you say never looked back, that's a pretty strong statement about how you feel about something. So what would you say is the big thing here? It's the environment. The everything from the dealers to the guests, promoters and the fans, everybody's like on the same wavelength. There's not any air of superiority or money gouging or anything that you see at a lot of the other conventions where it seems to be about the dollar. This one is more about having fun. It's a celebration of the movies, the people who made them, and uh, basically just that same vibe that you can't really... That I've been to a ton of conventions, and it's like that vibe is missing from a lot of the other ones because it's more about money. Not to say that you know everyone's that way, but this one seems very based on just the films and the fans and just having a good time. So once you walk through that door... There's no other costs involved. You know, you can yeah. pay your money and you can watch movies, you can talk them. And it's very uh, small, but that also keeps it, like, more tight. You know, there's, there's not... It doesn't get out of control like some of the other ones that are, like, 10,000 people walking through the door. Yeah. This one, like I said, there's there's a definite family vibe because everyone knows each other. And it, and, it's, and it stays the same. The convention hasn't changed one lick since it first started. Yeah. And that's something rare these days. Yeah. So, um, would you what would you say was your first real passion? Was it horror something that you worked into, or is it something that, uh, like, early on as a kid, you were like, "Oh, I really relate to this." Yeah, it was early on because that's the, the kind of films that my parents would go see. So we were always at the drive-in back in the seventies. I was born in seventy-one, mm -hmm. and from uh, probably about seventy-six when I turned five. I can recall the films that I saw. I probably fell asleep through half of them, but all that stuff is ingrained in my brain. I don't remember seeing comedies. I don't remember seeing dramas. None of that. It was all fantasy or monster-related films. So naturally, that's the stuff I just gravitated towards because that's what I was exposed to. Yeah. So I just took it 
to the next level. It's just like, that's the stuff I like, and I want to know more. So it started literally from when I was five years old. Yeah, that's that's good. And it's interesting. I'm liking, I'm hearing a couple of things from different people where their parents were actually mm-hmm. involved. And mm-hmm. Some of us aren't that lucky. Mm-hmm. A lot of people and, and have that whole exactly. deal. Yep. But having it early is great, and it sounds mm-hmm. like they promoted it rather well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So you mentioned around. Uh, first off, or did you get involved with the Dusk to Dawn shows? Were you there where they would have that? I huge... never did that. It was yeah. like whatever was playing um, anything from Piranha, Food of the Gods, yeah, Laser Blast, Orca. You know, that's all the stuff I remember. But none of the from Dusk Till Dawn's. I think yeah. my parents probably would have said no. We're not taking them to that. So yeah. it was usually just one or two movies, and then that was it. I, I'd be asleep by. It. Nine o'clock, anyway. So. Right. Oh, food of the gods actually scared me when I was a kid. It scared <laughs> was like, me too. That rat was yep. insane. Yep. That left a that left a scar in my brain as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the word I heard, which I hear just with about everybody that I talk to, is I wanted to learn more. There's the idea of knowledge, learning, mm-hmm. not just watching. Mm-hmm. So where did you go from there? You got the spark. What mm-hmm. was it that? Where did you go to build this up? The, the big key for me was Fangoria magazine when I first started seeing that on the newsstands. Now, I got into Famous Monsters right at the tail end, which mm-hmm. was like 1982. I started to notice that, but at that time, that magazine was really promoting E.T., Empire Strikes Back. That really wasn't what I was interested in, whereas Fangoria obviously was pushing the stuff that was current at the time, the early 80s stuff. Um, I've also been a big fan of rock and heavy metal music. So, Fangoria had an issue, issue, I think it was 34, they had Ozzy Osbourne as a werewolf on the cover. That issue, that was it. That sold me, I bought it, and it was the same thing. Right after I bought that, I knew that this was going to be something I was going to be into, and I think I subscribed literally the next issue, and I've been a subscriber since 1984. Yeah. So, that's where I started reading about this stuff. So, then again, that was kind of like the next evolution or the next step. Because you know, then I was like reading about it, and I went from that magazine. That's where it started. Yeah. D- did you find yourself uh, reading fiction, horror literature, or was it more visual? Not so much. I mean, Stephen King obviously was the big name back then. I started reading his stuff, but I didn't get into that as much. It was more about the films versus the fiction. I liked the fiction, like I said, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, mm-hmm. Ramsey Campbell, Clive oh, Barker, yeah. obviously. But I didn't have a, enough time to really delve into that like I really wanted to. So aside from some of those authors, I never really got into it as much. Yeah, I, I love hearing Ramsey Campbell's name. <laughs> That's one you don't always hear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you, of course, talked about Fangoria being a really big thing mm-hmm. for you. It's a magazine, Famous mm-hmm. Monsters, a magazine. Mm-hmm. So right. when did you decide you wanted to not just be on the sidelines reading it and you wanted to start making things yourself? That was probably a few years later, and again, it was through Fangoria, where I found the name Chaz Ballin. And when I found his name and found out he did Deep Red, which was advertised in the pages of Fangoria, I sent out for, actually before Deep Red, there was the Gore score. And I bought that, and that changed my life. That was it. Because the way he was writing about the films, even if it was one or two sentences, I was like, this is like the most inspiring thing I could ever imagine. That was the moment where I decided I want to write about it. Because then he was writing a column, then Gorezone magazine came out, and he had a column called Peace of Mind in every issue. And there was one in particular, it was, I think it was called like Faith, Fear, and Fanaticism, and he was talking about people who were into it, but inspiring them to kind of take the next level, you know. If you make a film or whatever it was, he's like, do it, you know, now's the time, blah, blah, blah. So I was inspired by that to say, you know what, I'm going to try my stab at doing something like Deep Red. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely where the spark was ignited for me to start, you know, try to write on my own and see where I could go from there. What was the first thing that you you wrote? The first thing I did was I I did something, it was uh, probably 1985, and it was called the Gore Gazette. Now at the time I had no idea that there already was something called the Gore Gazette in New York from Rick Sullivan. I didn't find out about that until years later. And it was strictly for myself. It was something I typed up on a Commodore 64, printed it out, and I looked at it. And it was just like, okay, that's where it started. But it never left my house. It was just just a stab at something just to see what it would look like. Yeah. Uh, when did you start getting fans? That was probably, this was in the 90s. 93 is when I first started 
uh, the cut and paste zine. Before I had a thing called Liquid Cheese, I was calling it Psychoholic Slag, which was a song from the White Zombie the yeah, band. Yeah. And I started with that, and I maybe ran off 50 copies. And I sent a couple of them out to other publishers, and one of them was Michael Weldon, who was doing Psychotronic mm -hmm. Video. He actually printed the cover of one of my issues in his fanzine section. That's when I started to get people who were writing to me. And I was blown away. I never expected him to... To a review it but b he actually printed the cover because he only printed like a handful of covers of the actual zine most of them it just yeah. had a little like write-up on it so when he did that and people started writing to me i was like well maybe i could actually do more you know maybe i people are interested in it so and then i just kind of went from there just to see where the interest was yeah it's uh really interesting to think that uh, it starts because you kind of get seen by somebody it might have been a cover mm -hmm. did you draw the cover I did it was, yeah. it was a drawing of Dario Argento actually oh, nice. it was totally me it was just done in marker I mean it was kind of crude but he must have thought something about it because like I said he printed it the whole thing was hand drawn the whole cover was hand drawn the inside Commodore 64 and then it was newspaper clippings and cut mm -hmm. paste that's all it was yeah. what do you think that did for you we talk about we want to have a voice we want to have that but uh, what do you think that that really relieved like something gets us to go from just reading and talking to our friends to actually spending hours on something mm -hmm. that maybe only you and your mother might see well as long as somebody one other person out there was willing to order it that's all I needed I figured, well, if somebody else is interested in it, they'll let me know, and they did. Yeah. So it kind of went from there. If nobody had an interest in it, I probably wouldn't have pursued it. Yeah. But that was just the fact that somebody would send me, you know, a letter and write me and say, you know, hey, I want your magazine. That, that's all I needed. Yeah. And it's kind of funny because, of course, uh, you mentioned music twice, heavy metal music twice, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's a big passion of mine as well, mm -hmm. and a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I find that there's that release mm -hmm. for both things and mm -hmm. it is a voice that you mm -hmm. want to have and people start bands and mm -hmm. punk was the same thing where you would uh, basically cut uh, an 8 by right. 8 square and send it out yep. and, and people right. would send you money for the music mm -hmm. and uh, I how was the when, first off when was the first Liquid Cheese created? That when was uh, 94 I believe is when I made the change see and it was funny because I was the psychoholic slag I was actually afraid of copyright because I thought well it's the name of a song uh -huh. so I thought ah, let me let me change that I wanted to get away from any legal ramifications if you will so the first issue of liquid cheese and again this wasn't anything that I thought was going to go beyond that at the time outside of where I was living you know outside of my city aside from sending it out to psychotronic but that was 94 so I didn't really know where that would go. It was just kind of like a trial thing. The first actual issue of Liquid Cheese that I took seriously was in 96. Because I got, that was when I got Windows 95 and I got a laptop computer. So that's when I thought, okay, now I've got the equipment. Now I'm going to take it seriously and I'm really going to try to improve it and make it look professional, but yet still be, you know, a zine that was self published rather than going through a publisher or a distributor or whatever. Yeah. And where uh, were you taking them to conventions? Was that the main way it was getting out? Not originally. I, I didn't start taking it to conventions until maybe the next year or two afterwards. Then I started going to uh, Chiller Theater in New Jersey. Then it kind of really mushroomed because then people were really asking me about it. Whereas before, it was just all local. Yeah. Now, uh, another thing that happens with punk rock bands and stuff like that is the critics or people that are fans, the roadies suddenly become part of the band. Mm -hmm. So in your magazine, did you have people who started writing for you? I did. Yeah, I did. I had people who were writing to me who were interested in writing about whatever, you know, whether it was Japanese uh, superhero TV shows or H.P. Lovecraft, whatever. You know, at that time, it didn't really matter. It was kind of like a hodgepodge of interests. So... Yeah, I probably had like about a half a dozen people who were writing to me, just sending me stuff. It was all correspondence through the mail because the internet was still right. in its infancy. So, yeah, I probably had about a half a dozen people who were sending me all kinds of stuff. Even independent filmmakers were sending me stuff on videotape so, to review, which was kind of cool. I didn't even expect that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, how, what would you say is like the the arc of the, of the work that you're doing, say a typical magazine, a typical issue, what's inside of it? it? I try to have convention reports 
it's convention reports and like DVD or Blu-ray reviews are like the key and then I try to have interviews if I can and I try to have like one main feature either on a specific film or a specific actor or director. I started out doing like smaller pieces where we're mainly just reviews and I, I was kind of getting tired of that. I'm like I need more meat, you know, I need more substance, more longer articles. So that's when I started like investigating filmmakers and actors and really doing some research and putting a little more time into it. I'd say the first, almost the first 30 issues were very thin. They were maybe barely 25 pages long and I started to get tired of that. I'm like, this doesn't feel like I put enough effort into it. Mm -hmm. and I look back at them now, I'm like, these issues are like terrible. So I started to put more effort into it and write longer articles. The page count increased, but I felt more confident that you know, now I have something. It's not just reviews. There's actual interviews. There's articles. And I also like doing artwork, like uh, uh -huh. publishing galleries and stuff like that, like several pages of artwork. So right now I'd say that's pretty much what a typical issue would consist of. Yeah. What the art, uh, the artwork is striking, to mm -hmm. say the least. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who are the artists that mostly are on your covers? Right now it's Rick Melton, who's uh, from England. He's my number one guy. He sends me tons of stuff. And I'm definitely going to use him. But prior to that, Putrid, which was Matt Carr, mm -hmm. he was another guy that I met at a convention whose artwork just blew me away. And I think he did about six covers, five or six covers for me. So he's another guy that, you know, I'd always use because his work, again, is so striking. His yeah. stuff is strictly black and white, whereas when I upgraded to color and I started to use Rick Melton more, that's where, you know, the connection came with him was because of those color right so uh do you sometimes get ideas from the artwork that's sent for you or to you or do you say hey i'm going to do something on uh night of the creeps it, it kind of is both because um rick sent me a piece for gorgasm which was a hugh gallagher shot on video thing then all of a sudden i, I got a spark because hugh gallagher ended up being at this convention the cinema wasteland as a dealer which blew me away because I hadn't seen Hugh for 10 years because he's from Chicago and me being from Milwaukee, we were close, so I'd always see him at the conventions. So in that case, the artwork inspired me to do an interview with Hugh Gallagher, whereas other times, it's just the art. You know, He could send me, it doesn't matter what it is. <clears throat> right. I'm not necessarily going to do an article on it, but the artwork is just so striking. So it really depends. It depends on what it is. Yeah. Do you have... Uh... Because some of the artwork, uh, with uh, any of the listeners get to t get a look at this, mm -hmm. some of it is pretty outre. Oh, <laughs> some yeah. of it's pretty oh, strong. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, right. Is there uh, anything that you what do you feel is the the thing that you most resonate with in films that are horror films? Do you find that uh, it sometimes or most of the time something that is a lot more visceral, or is it something that you would say is more subtle or shadowy? I like the visceral stuff. I like the, I like atmosphere. I guess atmosphere is, is a key. Um, whether it's, you know, the lighting, the music. There's a mood, you know. There's a certain mood that certain films have. And I guess, like I said, there's like a, like a vibe, a, a grim atmosphere. Because I think it's rare. I don't think you can find that too much. But when I see that in certain films, whether it's a new film or an old film, that's kind of what draws me in. I mean, you can have over-the-top special effects, you know, any of that, that's great. But there's something about a mood, and it's sometimes it's hard to define. And mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of filmmakers would probably tell you they didn't intend it to be yeah. that way. But through the editing, whatever, the process, the, from the time they made it to when it got released, there's something there. And there's certain films that have it, and that's the stuff that really draws me in. Yeah, if you were to tell someone who's coming right into horror, uh, relatively new, that you wanted to talk about mood, what movies would you say really have the mood that really struck you? favorites you know i go back to like a lot of the black and white stuff um mario baba you know yeah. he's, he's a perfect example where you talk about black sunday uh black sabbath you know mm -hmm. a lot of that that old stuff where there's a definite mood the gothic mood you know is definitely there but then you have like a film like the texas chainsaw massacre which to me defines the word horror you know there's there's so many characters in that film, and they're all sort of deranged to me. They're all sort of mm -hmm. like bent, like like they're not quite there. 
and it's that hot sun, you know, the, the thing of baking flesh, you know. Yeah. There's just something about that film. Even Toby Hooper's early stuff, like Eating Alive, um, The Fun House. Eating Alive probably even more so because there's a, there's a vibe in that film, too, that's it's hard to shake because oh, yeah. every character in that film seems crazed. Yeah, like it, like they're they're like you know you know two steps away from being completely unhinged. Yeah, you know, it's like swamp friendly. fever. Exactly, all that stuff. That's the kind of stuff that you know I tell people. It's all about mood, and you know a lot of those movies are just you know loaded with. It. I mean, those are just a couple of examples off the top of my head, but that's the stuff that you know I really key in that kind of sticks with me. Yeah, what would you say was a, a, a liquid cheese that you were like, man, am I so glad I wrote this? Um, well, going back to the interview, the the interview, for example, that I did with Hugh Gallagher was like probably my favorite, my favorite interview that I've ever done because he had like a lot to say about stuff. That for an interview, I would say that's probably one of my key ones. Um, but I wrote an article on. Two of them in particular that people said resonated with them a lot. One of them was on comic books, um, like early 80s, stuff like Gore Shriek, specifically Taboo. Mm. Um, and another one I did called 21st Century Horror Discovery, which was, I think I did that in about 2004. It was from like 99 to 2004, the newer horror films that were coming out then. Uh, I covered like a lot of stuff because I, I was kind of getting tired about how people were saying horror films were no good anymore. You know, anything new that, that was coming out was garbage. And I kind of did that article to say, look, there's a lot of good stuff out there, but some of it you probably have to dig for. And it might not even be filmed in America. There's probably still foreign stuff. But everybody was so fixated on 70s and 80s horror, which is what I grew up on. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, don't deny this new stuff that's coming out just because it was made in 2002. Yeah. Don't, you know, turn away from it. You know, give it a chance. Yeah. So I agree. that that was a big article for me that people were like, you know, some of those films you wrote about, I went to see because you know you you know the points you made were pretty valid. Yeah. So I was pretty happy with that. Yeah, great. And I think you're absolutely right. There's some uh, when we talk mood, I'm mm -hmm. no surprise that mm -hmm. uh, the 2000s there's a lot of atmosphere mm -hmm. that are in these movies, and there's mm -hmm. a lot of 70s dread. Mm -hmm. in these films mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and uh, there right. seem to be so many different uh, roots now I've never seen a time in horror where there were so many subgenres. right exactly and it's mm -hmm. just uh, do you find that uh, there's any that you just won't touch you're not that excited by not so much I mean the real like hardcore underground like we were talking about um, Toe Tag you know the August Underground right you know those films per se I wouldn't ever imagine myself like watching but I knew Fred Vogel and from knowing him and how nice of a guy he is I'm like you know what I'll, yeah. I'll check these films out but no if somebody said to me hey you know I want you to see these films you know they're just you know torture or whatever no nah, I'm not really those I wouldn't really go out of my way to see that's really not my cup of tea not to say that I won't watch them but I wouldn't actively seek them out right Right, and that's uh, that was a conversation that uh, we had late last night. Mm -hmm. Right, was, uh, people speaking about what is your limit. They were right. asking me what my limit was. Right. And it's not really about the subject, although mm -hmm. there are some subjects that if I hear it, I kind of get. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't really mm -hmm. want to talk there, but it's content or how right. you do it or intent. Right. Right. What you're trying to get from me? Mm -hmm. uh, right. What's a movie that surprised you that you were like, uh, I, this sounds like it's going to be horrible. I'm uncomfortable even thinking about it. But you saw it and you went, wow, that was actually done in a way that uh, surprised me. I, I cared about the characters, whatever it might be. Hmm, that's a pretty good question because there's probably a lot of them that are out there that um, I haven't really given too much thought of, but when I see it, I'll give you a good example of a, because I get a lot of screeners, and there was one movie I got, a newer film, it was just called Flowers, and I read there was no dialogue, and it was basically torturous serial killer who was piling up bodies of victims, and I, I didn't really give much thought to it, I'm like, how oh, this sounds, again, like some torture, whatever, but I couldn't believe how artistic it was. But it was unbelievably gory, viscera, guts. It's women like crawling through a corridor of a house littered with corpses, and they are. Well, I don't want to, you know, ruin it for anyone who might want to see it. But when you come to realize what these women are and what they represent through no dialogue, I was completely blown away because I went into it thinking, "Ah, oh, this is just going to be 
something, you know, again, gratuitous and gore for gore's sake, but I couldn't believe that it was made with such artistic passion that I was actually, by the end of the movie, I'm going, that was brilliant. Yeah. Totally brilliant. Hi, folks. My conversation with Dave Kosenke extended beyond the time we had available in Ohio, but Dave graciously agreed to complete the interview by phone. So what follows is the rest of the interview. I apologize in any difference in sound quality, but the conversation was just too good not to share with the listeners. So here's my second part of my interview from the abyss with Dave Kosenke. So you have a pretty encyclopedic knowledge of horror films and an obvious love for all the different eras of horror films. So what I'd like to do is ask you to give me some of your favorite films of each decade. Uh, and uh, so let's start with the 1930s. Um, Mad Love is the one that kind of comes to my mind right away, uh, the Peter Lorre yeah. version. Because um, I, I just think that uh, the, the universal films from that that decade are the ones that everybody loves which which i do too but mad love has always been a personal favorite of mine just because it's just such an odd like bizarre little film and just kind of seems a little bit left to center from uh what universal was doing at that time so it's one that like i said it's just always been his performance is just you know through the roof in that so it's always been a oh, favorite yeah. That's fantastic. And that, like uh, I think I've mentioned to you before, I've never heard uh, anybody say Mad Love is their favorite. So that, that's really cool. And it's a pretty twisted film. So that's also pretty interesting. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How about the 1940s? Uh, the 40s, I definitely have a uh, big fascination with uh, the Val Luton productions. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of hard hard to like pick one out of them, but I had probably the Body Snatcher is the one that I would have to say would be my, my pick. Okay. Definitely because, you know, the Boris Karloff performance right. is pretty much one of his best. Yeah, yeah. How about the 1950s? 50s, I, I really enjoy um, Curse of the Demon or a.k.a. Night of the Demon, depending on which which version you look at, because um, I just can't can't get enough of that. I think that um, Jacques Tuner is uh, a master. Like again, that kind of goes back to the the Val Luton in the forties. Mm -hmm. But um, just the the whole concept of science versus reason, and you know, I I I totally love the whole um, backstory of the film about how they initially didn't want to show a demon or a monster, but mm -hmm. the studio dictated otherwise. And it's great because what, you know, what they ended up doing is uh, such a phenomenal, like monster. It's just, you know, one of the, the classic monsters of that, that decade. And, you know, that, that decade is filled with, um, just so many wonderful monsters, you know, from all over, obviously that was the mm -hmm. birth of birth of Godzilla in Japan and, you know, yeah. all the, all the crazy stuff that was happening, um, here in America, which were, you know, the the big bug, you know, the, the mutant, and, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, the, the the demon and Curse of the Demon had some pretty pretty good competition when it comes to, like, memorable monsters from that decade. But um, that's, yeah. you know, that, that that's always one that just, you know, always sticks with me. It's, it's such a great film. Yeah, and I'm holding the the issue number 41 of Liquid Cheese, and I see the Rick Melton cover uh, is yeah. the Night of the Demon, and it looks absolutely fantastic. So, yeah, I'm not surprised that uh, that would be the one that you you have a lot of love for. And I think it's a pretty great film as well. How about the 1960s? 60s, I I, I always go back to, to Psycho. It, it always seems like it's the... The popular choice, but you know, I'll, I'll kind of chime in with everybody else. Um, it's always the film that when I get questioned from time to time, or people would say, "Well, what do you think is the most influential like horror film of all time?" I I always tend to go back to Hitchcock and Psycho because I mm -hmm. think that any any film after that where you had a, a knife wielding Psycho or anything of that sort, it it you know it got away from the gothic like monsters and it brought it into uh, basically, you know, this could be the guy next door. Um, that that whole concept, which I think really flourished in the early '80s, obviously with uh, the Halloween and Friday Thirteenth and all that stuff. But to me, it all it definitely all goes back to Psycho. I, I really think that that was the blueprint for any um, mad slasher film or anything, what have you, from that point on. So I would definitely have to say Psycho. Yeah, well, hats off to uh, Mr. Hitchcock. I, I feel pretty much the same way on that, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's still in, in my top movies of all time. Uh, so how about the 1970s? 
'70s is uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's mm-hmm. that's another that that's another like blueprint film for um, what I would always say would be like a, a pure horror film. You know, from the yeah. the way it was filmed to the the characters, and there's just a, an atmosphere that permeates that mm-hmm. whole entire movie. That's something that's really hard to capture. You know, it's just it, it's just that mood of like dread and like just grim. Mm-hmm. Grim brutality, which is great because you don't even really see much. You know, it's all right. more more the suggestion, which again kind of goes back to previous decades, what filmmakers and everything were were not really wanting to show everything. But mm-hmm. that film, you know, can play unedited on TV. You know, you wouldn't think nothing of it, but it's just that whole atmosphere and that grim vibe that makes it a lot more disturbing than really what it is when you really sit there and analyze it and take a look at what you see versus what you don't see. It's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. I actually kind of look at uh, Texas Chainsaw as like its own genre. <laughs> that yeah, one movie right. is like there's the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and, and that's it because right. uh, it does feel like madness. It's the right. only movie that I can think of where it really feels like people might have gone a little nuts while they were making that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Yep. How about the 1980s? The 80s is like the the decade where I really grew up. I was a teenager um, mm-hmm. in 1983. So from that point on, I was just like trying to like um, dive into as much as I possibly could. That that early 80s from like 1980 to 85, I think in particular, was just like just filled with great stuff. So my yeah. my you know I, I it's hard for me to pick one. Uh, the, the the two that I that I always like cherish are Reanimator and Videodrome. Those those two mm. in particular always made like a big impact on me. And Videodrome in particular, I think, plays well the older I got because I was able to see a lot more of what Cronenberg was trying to put into the story. Whereas maybe when I first saw it, I was more about the effects and the weird yeah. visuals. But then over the years, it's like the story really resonated. And he was actually kind of predicting a lot of the stuff that would happen with the way we watch TV and see everything, you know, down the line, too, which, you know, again, is pretty pretty genius when you think about it. Yeah, I mean, uh, and both of those films are, are movies that I would say uh, were, uh, they just went all the way. They were mm-hmm. unapologetic for what they wanted to be. They didn't censor mm-hmm. themselves in any way on storyline or on effects. So mm-hmm. that's uh, pretty cool that those are the two that you picked. Uh, mm-hmm. How about, now, everybody that I've talked to pretty much has said that the 90s was the the, the wasteland. There was nothing yeah. really to watch. But I think you've mentioned before that you, you feel there's always something to watch. So what would you say in the 90s is really worthy? Well, the, yeah, the 90s was a pretty a pretty bleak period. I mean, there's, there's a lot of films that... Um, the, the biggest thing to me that, that I see in the 90s was uh, a lot of the big studios were shying away from horror, you know, as far as even like mm-hmm. a tag or a, a genre per se. They didn't want their films to be classified as such. It, it, it all of a sudden it became like a, like a bad word, like, well, we have mm-hmm. to call this a thriller now, you know, or this, this can't be. <laughs> like S- Silence of the Lambs is probably the best example where everybody was just like, well, that's not a horror film, you know, but, you know, to, to me it is. But the film that actually like, knocked me out in the theater that I saw, which, again, wasn't really, I don't think, labeled as a horror film, but to me it's 100% would be seven. You know, the the whole mm-hmm. David, David Fincher, when he came out with that, was just mm-hmm. like, you know, that was probably, I saw a lot of stuff in the in the theaters in the 90s just because I was so diehard to see whatever I could. I'm like, well, there's got to be, you know, something good. And when I just saw that, I didn't really know a whole lot about it, but that that film really, like, floored me with the visuals and the whole story and, you know, everything, the way it kind of came up towards mm-hmm. the end, I, I thought was just like genius. I mean, it was, again, it was a big studio film, big name stars and everything. But again, you talk about grim, disturbing subject matter. I mean, it's it's about as grim as it gets. Oh, yeah. Uh, Fincher, as far as I was concerned at that point, was at the top of his game and was mm-hmm. a master of that. And mm-hmm. uh, I always look at Seven as kind of, uh, if you go back to the movie Jaws, one of the more uh, foreboding scenes is nothing mm-hmm. more than Quint talking about sharks in the water right. in World War Two. And I look at Seven as the entire movie are those stories. You come yeah. in after the fact on everything, and the dread just builds and builds and builds. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. 
How about the 2000s? I mean, we can go all the way up to 2015 because there's such a, a huge amount. I'm not sure. Well, actually, you probably are very good at knowing the difference between the 2006 movies and the 2015 movies. Well, yeah. I mean, I my my knowledge on like newer stuff. I don't. I don't. Unfortunately, I don't get to watch as many newer films as I would really like to. I mean, I'll I'll definitely admit that. I I tried to keep up, but I be became inundated with uh, screeners from, you know, companies releasing all this kind of, like, older, more obscure stuff. So it's kind of like the, the newer films. It's kind of like I've, I haven't been kept keeping up like I normally would. But um, the 2000s, uh, there was definitely a big upsurge in, uh, you know, again, a lot of that grim, disturbing mm -hmm. stuff because I think a lot of the directors and special effects artists, writers, and such and forth, they were the ones who grew up in that the 70s, early mm -hmm. 80s so they were kind of like trying to um recapture a lot of those moments of a lot of that stuff that they grew up on which i think mm -hmm. is interesting because i think a lot of fans tend to like um bad mouth a lot of that stuff like the, the the film that i would pick you know right off the top of my head would be the devil's rejects from rob zombie because i think mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. i think that a lot of people like to bad mouth him you know for various reasons but again i think he's one of those guys that grew up with a certain, you know, decade and certain love of certain mm -hmm. films. And I think that House of a Thousand Corpses was there. You know, I mean, I think he had the idea there, but I think he really kind of mm -hmm. corralled everything he wanted to do with the sequel and really make it like the film, like he would basically wanted to recapture that, that 70s grim vibe, like we were talking about Texas mm -hmm. Chainsaw Massacre. You know, a lot of, a lot of filmmakers were inspired by that. Not to say that The Devil's Rejects is like that, but I think that it's trying to recapture that that kind of vibe, that that whole, like... And, and some people don't even really call that a horror film, you know? I mean, a lot of people mm -hmm. think thinks it kind of crosses over into whatever crime or this or that, but, but again, I think it has that vibe from the 70s stuff, and I think it probably does it as well as any of the other ones that I've seen, so kudos okay. to him. Yeah, yeah. So back to the 90s, only because I want to get back to Liquid Cheese. Because sure. uh, mm -hmm. I start in the 90s, uh, and it's going strong during the fanzine boom, but then right. the culture changes, the fanzines start to disappear pretty rapidly. Yet here you are, Liquid Cheese survives, it's what, 23 years later. So how'd you do it, and what kept you going? Just basically the, the passion for everything that um, I was accumulating, you know, whether it's watching, whether it's reading, whether it was listening, it, you know, I, I still kept into all the stuff that I was into. And I, you, you can kind of look through the old issues, um, the mm -hmm. ones from the 90s, and totally see where my head was at. There's a lot of um, Hong Kong cinema from that time period, mm -hmm. which would be early 90s, mid 90s. I was watching a lot of Hong Kong stuff. There's even a lot of anime in those issues. So, you know, Japanese animation was starting to really creep into um, American culture at that time. Mm -hmm. And we we're kind of like tapping into that. The Internet in 95, um, when I got my first uh, PC, and I started mm -hmm. getting on that when I was in, into the Internet and first got hooked up to the Internet, then you could kind of see just little smidgens of stuff and how the websites for horror and all these different other genres were just starting out. And you could just see where, where people were trying to connect with others who were into the same stuff. Because prior to that, the biggest mm -hmm. thing I had, obviously, with the fanzine, but the other thing was tape trading. So there was kind of like, whether you were trading zines or, or trading videotapes, that was kind of the big underground network. So I think the, the fanzine always kind of tied into the whole tape trading thing because a lot of the stuff I was reviewing were tapes that I was just trading with people. So it, it, it kind of one, one thing played into the other. And it, it was just, you know, again, I would do an issue, um, fill it with stuff that I was interested in, and mm -hmm. if, if, if somebody else just happened to be into that same thing where they wanted to buy an <laughs> issue, you know, hey, all the better. But, you know, when I first started out, it was more of um, what, what would please me. You know, I wasn't really mm -hmm. thinking about doing anything big with it. I mean, if, you know, ten people bought it, whatever, you know, I, I didn't I have no expectations. It was just doing it because I was... Just sharing what I was passionate about. Like I said, if somebody else picked up on it, you know, all the better. Mm. And uh, I think uh, you've been pretty uh, pretty good about getting to people that way. And, uh, of course, going to conventions, I, I'm assuming that that's probably the biggest way that you get to touch people at this point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's 
that's been a big key is just to um, connect with everybody at the conventions, which kind of goes back to when I first started going to conventions, which the bigger shows, I should say, which was in the 90s again. I was Chiller Theater out in New Jersey. Um, mm-hmm. I went to several of those, and I started to, to connect with people back then who had heard of the zine. You know, I was just shocked that somebody would come up to me at a convention and say, hey, you know, I you know, uh-huh. I love your stuff. I mean, I never would have thought that anybody, you know, in another state would have even came up to me. But, it, you know, the, the seed was planted back then. Like you said, at the conventions was really where... Um, I started to really make a lot of connections. The other interesting thing was, too, in the the trailer theater shows, was there was a lot of um, distributors and uh, publishers from England who were doing a lot of the the British fan scenes at mm. that time. Mm. And those, those guys loved the American stuff. And then I was actually, like, the other way around. I'm like, well, the American stuff's good, but the British stuff, you know, is even better. Mm. So we were, you know, we were kind of going back and forth, and these guys would buy, like, bulk issues of liquid cheese and gold turn around and sell them in england which you know to me again was, uh-huh. I was uh, you know i was just blown away that i could get a catalog from like media publications or whatever and sure enough you know liquid cheese would be in there i you know those guys love that stuff so that was great too just to have that connection with you know people overseas now that's fantastic mm-hmm. i'm looking forward to meeting more people overseas as well uh so um when what's the next uh convention that you're going to go to Flashback weekend in Chicago, which I believe is, I think, the first weekend of August. Okay, great. So if anybody's listening and they want to talk to you after they read a little bit of Liquid Cheese, they can just come on up to you and uh, see you at that point at Flashback. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm always there. That's like um, about an hour drive for me, so that's that's real real easy drive. At any time there's anything in the Chicago area, I, I try to go to it because it just the, the vicinity is very close. But Flashback is definitely my, my favorite show out of, you know, all the ones I've been to in the Chicago area. So every year I'm I'm always going to be there. So, Oh, great. And, uh, Dave, thanks so much for giving me as much time as you did. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure that I give you a little bit of time to be able to talk about uh, how people can get in touch with you uh, so that if they want to get one of the published uh, articles or actually one of the magazines, uh, they can do that. So y- you want to give your, your pitch? <laughs> Sure, it's uh, liquidcheesefanzine.storeenvy.com. Or you can link up to me on, I'm on Facebook. I have two different accounts. Just type in Liquid Cheese Fanzine. Or you can just type in my name, Dave Kosanke, K O S A N K E, and you'll be able to get a hold of me there. So either way, um, both, uh, both uh, links are there for, for the liking. All right, fantastic. And I'm here looking at both issue number one of Liquid Cheese and issue number 41. Looking forward to seeing what's going to happen on 42. And uh, we've been speaking with Dave Kosanke, creator of the long-running and legendary underground fanzine, Liquid Cheese. It is an exhaustive love letter to everything from horror, heavy metal, sleaze, gore, comics, fanzines, books, magazines, vinyl, laser discs. DVD, Blu-ray, Serial Killers, Japan, uh, Pro Wrestling, Triple X, Conventions, anything else that defies description. Is there anything that I left out? Uh, that, that pretty much covers it. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Well, thanks again for your time, Dave, and thanks to everybody who's been listening. To everybody, stay hellbent. And thanks for listening, folks. Hellbent for Horror was written and broadcast by me, S.A. Bradley, and produced by me and Lisa Gorski. You can subscribe to Hellbent for Horror on iTunes and Stitcher. And if you like the show, please consider writing a review on iTunes. It really helps. You can find more on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Hellbent for Horror. And I'm on Twitter at Hellbent Horror. You can also find out more info on my website, hellbentforhorror.com. Till next time, stay hellbent.